Well, I know that um, it's really trendy right now to talk about the things that you're uh, binge watching on TV. You know, that's all the, the talk that, that people are, are, are doing around the water coolers and stuff like that at work, right? Actually, I don't think any place has a water cooler anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but everyone talks about the shows that they're watching, and, and uh, I, I have to admit, I don't really watch a lot of the shows that, that everyone else watches. I mean, most of the stuff that Hollywood puts out, probably about 99% of it is not worth watching. Um, but I do, I have been wa binge watched a show recently, uh, and you're probably going to think I'm kind of a history nerd for doing this, uh, but the show that I recently watched that I really enjoyed was a show called Tales from the Explorers Club. It was on Discovery Channel. It was, um, there's a show about uh, the Explorers Club out in New York City, which is an organization of people from the 19th uh, and, and 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, it was this exclusive club of people that, that really were all about making discoveries in this world. So people like Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, the first to climb Mount Everest, or um, Admiral Perry uh, to discover the, you know, travel to the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, people like that who did these groundbreaking expeditions, whether they were to undiscovered places in the world or to the bottom of the ocean or even into to outer space. Alan Shepard and some of the, the great astronauts, um, you know, they were all members of this Explorers Club. And so the show was all about these expeditions and tales of the expeditions that they took to the distant corners of the earth and the breakthroughs, the scientific breakthroughs that they made. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm a history nerd, so I loved it. Um, and it, it started me looking at, at, at these expeditions, these, these great tales of adventure uh, of some of our, our forefathers as they, they went out and explored this beautiful world that God has given us. And what I found as I was looking through these stories of exploration, what was even more interesting than the, the historic tales that we know of was the stories of the, the failed expeditions that usually preceded uh, those great moments of, of exploration and discovery. I don't know if I have a morbid streak in me or something, but, you know, reading about these, these failed expeditions was actually even more fascinating. And so I wanted to share with you a story of a failed expedition here this morning as kind of a way of leading into our subject for today. Some of you will remember from your American history class that uh, the New World, uh, according to the way that we were all taught, according to most modern mainline academics, uh, the New World was discovered in 1592 when who? 40, 42, 1542, when who sailed the ocean blue? Columbus, right? Yeah, Christopher Columbus. All right. 1492. I knew there was a 90 in it. Oh. All right. Yeah, 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? Actually, he wasn't the first explorer to discover America. I mean, he, he wasn't. Uh, the Vikings were here uh, well before he ever was. Leif Erikson had a colony in Newfoundland of the, of the Vikings, and there were possibly others even before that. We know the Chinese were uh, on the west coast of America about the same time the Vikings were uh, in, up in Newf Newfoundland. So, But we think of Columbus, right? He was like the, the first to discover, uh, discover this, this new world. And do you remember why he was sailing to the new world? He was trying to get to, the, to, to Asia, right? Yeah, he was, he was sailing west to go to the east because uh, he believed the world was round. And, and so he thought if he could sail west, he could find an easier way to get to China and to India. Unfortunately, there was this great big land mass that was right in the way that he had no idea of. And so when he landed, he discovered North and South America. And, and then once the, the Europeans realized how extensive this continent was, the quest became to find a way around it, because they still wanted to get to China. And, and the only way that they knew of getting around it was to sail all the way around the southern tip of South America to get into the Pacific Ocean and then uh, over to the, to the Indies to, and to China. So the quest in the 1600s became the idea of the fabled Northwest Passage. You remember that term from school? It was the idea that you could sail north of Canada and get around North America and get over to, to Asia, which you can do, technically, if you hit it at just the right time of year, the dead of summer, right? You can, you can technically do it, but, uh, but it's an extreme challenge, and it was, it was beyond what the technology could do in the 1600s. 
Well, they didn't realize that at the time. They didn't realize how big North America actually was. So there was an explorer in the 1600s by the name of Henry Hudson. You heard that name before? Henry Hudson is not the old crotchety car in the movie Cars. That's Hudson Hornet. Henry Hudson is the one that the Hudson River is named for, the dirtiest river in America. What an honor. Uh, he discovered, or he, he was famous for charting the coastline of New England, and especially New York. And he sailed up the Hudson River a long ways, charting its course, hoping that that would be the way to get around North America and, and over into that Northwest Passage. So we named the Hudson River for him. There's another piece of real estate, though, that also bears his name, and it's not in New York. It's not near the Hudson River. If you go north of Canada, north of Ontario, you actually encounter a huge body of water that's referred to as Hudson Bay. That's right. Hudson Bay was named in, on Henry Hudson's very last exploration voyage. He had sailed around Canada, around Newfoundland, charted the whole coast, sailed into Hudson Bay looking for the Northwest Passage, and he sailed into Hudson Bay in August, which means that he got iced in. He was iced into Hudson Bay until May of the next year when it started to freeze. So 1611 in May, after wintering all year, in, all winter in northern Canada in the sub-zero temperatures, Henry Hudson decided that he was going to continue pressing on to find that Northwest Passage. He was going to do it. The only problem was his men decided, uh-uh, <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So they took Henry and his son and seven crew members who were still faithful to him, and they threw him overboard. They put him on a life raft in the middle of Hudson Bay, and they sailed for England, with Henry rowing furiously behind, him, behind them, demanding that they stop. And their only response was to put on more sail and leave him in their wake. No one ever saw or heard from Henry Hudson again. We presume he died there in northern Canada, in the bay that's named for him. The expedition failed because it was more than they could possibly do. It was poorly planned. They got there at the wrong time of year. But it mainly failed because there was no unity in his crew. They didn't believe in his cause. They weren't committed to it the same way that he was. And so the crew fell apart into this situation of, of mutiny. And Henry lost his life because of it. You know, there needs to be unity for a expedition to succeed. And a lack of unity can, can bring any kind of adventure uh, to a, a dead stop. It certainly did for, for Henry Hudson. And it can do the same thing for any kind of venture that we happen to be a part of. So if you think about us here as a church, we have this venture, we have this expedition, this task, this mission of sharing the love of Jesus Christ with this community. But it can come to a dead stop if there's a lack of unity within the church. And so over and over again in God's word, you come across the topic of unity. That the church of Christ needs to have unity. That the, the congregation, the fellowship of believers needs to have a, a unity among it in order to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given us. You know, all this, this month we're talking about spiritual habits, right? Right? We're talking about uh, the things that we need to develop in order to accomplish the mission of Jesus, the characteristics, the habits that we need to have in our life to be the people that he's called us to be. And we started this month talking about prayer, and I challenge you to pray the promises of Scripture, right? Pray for the things that God tells us to pray for, because those are the prayers that he's going to answer. And I gave you a 28-day guide to praying the promises of, of Scripture. And I know some of you have come back to me and you've talked to me about how, how much you've enjoyed that. Well, what I want to do here this morning is I want to tell you, if, if you have experienced an answer to those prayers, if that challenge has meant something to you, will you reach out to us here at the church this week and let us know? We would love to, to, to hear that. Uh, I would love the affirmation, and we would love to share that with everybody else, too, on how how that prayer challenge has, has affected you. So, so reach out to us this week. It can be email. You can call the church. You can do it on, online on Facebook, or you can do it on our, the comments of our YouTube video if you're watching this later online. Um, just reach out and let us know how that has affected you. But I, I challenge you to be in prayer, regularly to be in prayer, because it makes a huge difference 
in our life. I also challenge you to be reading Scripture every day. Uh, we can't know what God is calling us to do if we're not reading His Word because He gives us His will in His Word. So we have to be in it every single day. And then last week, uh, as Connor mentioned earlier, I challenged you to be generous because we serve a God who is giving, who gave of his, Himself. He gave of His own Son so that you and I could be saved. It is one of the defining characteristics of who God is, that He is always giving. So however it is, we need to find opportunities every single day to give to His kingdom. Whether it's you know, helping someone that we see that's destitute, whether it's giving our time and effort into building a, a friendship, a relationship with people around us that we can share the love of Jesus, whether it's giving to the church, whether it's giving to missions, we have to find those opportunities to be generous because that's the way God is. And now this morning what I want to talk to you about is that we need to have unity in the church and the way unity is developed is if you and I have a habit of serving and sacrifice. That's how unity is developed in the church. We have to have a habit of being willing to serve, being willing to put aside our own selves, our selfishness, and, and even sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom of God. When that happens, unity develops in the church around the mission of Jesus Christ, and we see the gospel of Jesus then in the church change the community around us. I want to share with you a scripture reading that that talks about this idea of unity and, and service that connects them together for us. And it comes from the book of Philippians. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 2. It's a very famous scripture reading. I guarantee you've heard it before because I've mentioned it several times. So uh, Philippians chapter 2, it's verses 1 through 11. And I want you to listen here for what Paul says about unity and how unity is developed through the idea of service and sacrifice. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Sounds like unity, right? It's what we're called to. Loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. He continues on, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was, not, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this connection in this passage here, the connection is between the idea of unity that Paul calls for in the church and the attitude of Jesus Christ. The argument that Paul is making here is that if we want to have the unity, if we want to have the one mind, the one... Uh, focus, the one mission together, if we want to truly love one another and support one another, then we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and our own desires, and we have to be willing to adopt the attitude of Christ, the same mindset, the same characteristics of Jesus. Paul directs us to the greatest example of our faith. He directs us to, to Jesus. He has complimented the Philippians on how well they're growing in their faith, and as he calls them to this idea of unity, to make his joy complete, in order for the church to be strong and effective, then they need to have the attitude of Christ. They need to have the same kind of mind that he has. And they need to be humble like Jesus was humble. He always thought of serving others before serving himself. It didn't matter how tired Jesus was. It doesn't matter how drained he was by the events. It didn't matter if he was going through grief and sorrow personally. He was always looking for opportunities to serve people, 
to teach them, to heal them. Always looking for opportunities. Everything about Jesus was that he was willing to humble himself and even sacrifice himself for the good of others. Not because he wanted to, but because that's what we as people needed. You know, this passage that I shared with you, verses 6 through 11, are actually, it's actually probably one of the oldest poems that it was ever written about Jesus. Now, we don't know if it was a, a hymn that was used in the early church or if it was a creed that was used, kind of like the Apostles' Creed that, you know, tells us the essentials of our faith and what unites us together as, as followers of Christ. Um, we're not sure which one of those it was, but this is a, a poem about Jesus that goes back to uh, within a few years of his resurrection. So the, the people who knew Jesus the best, the disciples, the first followers of Jesus, those who had spent their life, knew him on earth, followed him you know, for years of their life, these people who knew Jesus the best wrote this to tell others about what was important about Jesus. And it's interesting that when you look at that poem, what they highlight about Jesus is not necessarily his love, it's not his power to perform miracles. You know, they're not reciting how Jesus healed people and how he rest- made the lame to walk and the blind to see or all those different kinds of things. What they tell us about Jesus, what they thought was most important to know about Jesus, his greatest characteristic was his desire to serve, his desire to sacrifice, always putting the needs of others in front of himself. That's what exemplified Jesus. That's what stuck out in their mind as they were thinking about who is this guy that we're serving? What do we need people to know about him if they're going to be followers of Jesus? Well, they need to know that he served. They need to know that he gave himself as a sacrifice. And they need to know that that's the example for us. So this poem was written as a way of conveying that truth about Jesus and encouraging his followers to not only believe the correct things about him, but to act like Jesus acted. You see, this perception of, of Jesus who prayed, you know, not my will but thine be done, this perception of Jesus was, was absolutely intentional. He came in order to serve. He showed that at the Last Supper as he washed the disciples' feet. He prayed that continually over and over again in his life. Every opportunity that he had to serve people or to, to go away and be by himself, he always chose to serve people. This was absolutely intentional on his part. And it's exactly what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples as well. That if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we need to do the same kinds of things. We need to serve and sacrifice. You remember the story in the Gospels where Jesus takes the disciples aside and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they come back with all these different answers. And and finally, Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes his great confession, right? You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And and Jesus compliments Peter on that. And then later he has to go back and correct Peter's misunderstanding of what it meant for him to be the Messiah, right? The the get behind me Satan conversation that I'm sure was a kind of a roller coaster. The up moment of Peter making that confession and the down moment of him totally misunderstanding what he had said. Well, in between those two conversations, there's a a very important section of Scripture where Jesus is talking about going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying. And in that conversation, what is part of, you know, part of what causes Peter to, to misunderstand Jesus so much is that Jesus tells his disciples that if they're going to be his followers, they have to take up their what? Their cross and follow him, right? I'm sure that's not what Peter wanted to hear. That's why he, he, he reacted so strongly against this idea of Jesus suffering and dying, because he didn't want to have to suffer and sacrifice either. But Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, take up your cross means that you're willing to put aside your comfort. You're willing to put aside your selfishness the desire to serve yourself. You're willing to to lay that down, your priorities, your prerogatives, your your plans for for what you want your life to look like, what you want to do, how you want to spend your time, how you want to invest yourself. Take up your cross means you're willing to put that down. You're willing to die to it. And you're willing instead to take up the task of Jesus. 
you're willing to serve and sacrifice like he did. That's what Jesus says it means to be a follower of his. That we're willing to lay aside our prerogatives, our selfish human nature, and become more like him. To serve the way that he did, love people the way that he did. You know, I want to challenge you this week, continue to challenge you, because that's what we need to develop habits, right? You need to, we need to be challenged enough, motivated enough to actually do something and to do it long enough that it becomes a habit in our life. So I want to challenge you this week to have the same attitude as Christ, to be willing to serve and sacrifice like he did. I want to challenge you this week to find tangible ways to love and serve your neighbor. You know, I mentioned those shirts that we have out uh, in the lobby available for us. I want to really challenge you to find an opportunity every single day to do something kind to someone else, to serve them. Even if it means going out of your way, even if it means putting aside your own agenda for a little while, putting aside your own desire to be served, to have someone do something nice for you instead. Put that aside and look for opportunities to serve like Jesus served, to do what's best for someone else. You know, it may be something simple like, you know, just a kind word that you can share with someone who's discouraged. It may be investing your time into a relationship, inviting someone to come to church. It may be sharing your faith with them, or it may be just an, an act of kindness, buying lunch for someone helping them with their bills. Or maybe it's, you know, this time of year, maybe it's raking someone's leaves, your neighbor's leaves or something like that. There's all different kinds of little things that we can do to share the love of Jesus with other people. That's what we're called to. We're called to acts of service. We're called to acts of sacrifice because that's the kind of God that we serve. So I want to challenge you this week. Love and serve your neighbors. Pray for opportunities every single day to share the love of Jesus. And when you start making a difference in their life, tell them it's because Jesus loves them. And tell them it's because we love them as a church that you're doing this. And you'll see the kingdom of God grow and spread the way that Jesus intended it to. Let's pray together. Father, we know that it is not in our human nature to serve and follow you the way that we should. It's a, it goes against our selfishness. It goes against our natural inclinations and desires. But Lord, it is the path of life. Father, we pray that you would give us a desire to truly be your people, to walk in your ways, Lord, to be obedient to the things that you tell us to, to put aside the sins and temptations that hinder us, that, that drag us down, and to, Lord, walk in faithfulness to you. Father, we pray that you would give us a desire to have the same attitude that you had, that though you were God, you did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but you gave up your divine privileges. You took on the form of a human being. You became a slave. And you were willing to suffer and die in our place. You were willing to do what was best for us. So Father, we just pray that that you would give us that same desire. That when we see people around us, Lord, we would be looking for opportunities to do what's best for them and to share the love of Jesus with them. Use us, Lord, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.